Apple Watch Ultra, Garmin Phoenix, and now the new Epix 2 Pro. If you're after your first sports watch, looking for an upgrade, or even switching between one of these, you might want details of every technical specification and then graphs and charts to back it up, so you can see which is the ultimate wearable device. So you might be in the wrong place, because I don't really care if the heart rate monitor is doctor approved or NASA think the GPS tracking is best in the business, or even if the new function on this really will calculate exactly the distance I need to run to burn off a donut and still have sufficient energy left to not induce an exhausted post-exercise calorie binge. That was just made up. What I care about is that when I stick the watch on my wrist, I feel like I'm wearing something I'm glad I purchased, that it looks right, it does the things I need it to do, and any downsides are minimal. That's it. Although the donut thing sounds cool. So my initial thoughts coming up, including would the new Phoenix Pro have been a better choice or does the new Epix mean the Phoenix is no longer top dog? Does the Apple still have a place on my wrist beyond using it to make contactless payments for skinny lattes and vegan wraps? And am I even keeping the new Epix? That's actually a yes because the dog chewed up the box so it isn't going back. Give it to me, Lincoln. Right, a brief history of my experience with these devices. Beginning of last year, I owned a Phoenix 6X. This is my Garmin Phoenix 6X Pro. It has done everything with me from racing over mountains to ultra distance runs that lasted deep into the night and even whizzed around the occasional park run. And I bought the Phoenix 7X and the Epix Gen 2 to see which one would replace the 6X. And the Phoenix won that battle just. It really came down to the fact that sometimes I make decisions as though I'm still a 14 year old and Predator is playing in the cinema. I just like the big rugged look. Phoenix models come in 42 mil, small, 47 mil, medium, and the X, 51 mil Arnold size. The Epix was only available in 47 mil. That doesn't sound a huge difference, but when you're 14, every millimeter counts. It's not a small watch, but it doesn't have the reassuring heft that the 7X has. And so while I thought that the new AMOLED screen on the Epix was very pretty, on that slightly smaller display, it just left it looking a bit fancy pants. Doing cardio in the gym, it would be worn by a person off for a spin class where you also dance on the bike. It's not without its appeal, but the Phoenix is doing the treadmill at 45 degrees and then punching things while jogging. So the big Phoenix 7X remained at the flagship model for me, sent the Epix back. Interestingly, Jenna loved the Epix display, but also settled on a Phoenix. Her first sports watch went for the 7S, 42 mil, because for her, the Epix was too big. At the time, I thought neither of us will ever own an Epix, because at some stage, Garmin will no doubt stick the AMOLED display on all the Phoenix models anyway. And then later in the year, Apple launched their Ultra Watch, and I bought it. It's got a picture of my dog on it. Not expecting to like it, but much to the horror of Garmin fanboys everywhere, I found myself wearing it almost exclusively. It's not rugged, it doesn't look like a sports watch. If I take too long to do the strap up, it runs out of battery before I finished. But the ability to have my iPhone on my wrist and leave my real iPhone in the house was so game changing, I just ignored the inner 14 year old in me asking if the CIA had me pushing too many pencils. And within six months, I'd settled somewhere in the middle. When doing an activity where I'd want my phone but not want to carry it, like a training run, Apple Watch, was perfect. When doing an event where battery, mapping, tracking was crucial, it would be the Garmin. And because bouncing between the two meant neither were ever able to get a grasp on stuff like training load and sleep data, because you need to have them on 24 seven for that, I gave up caring about that sort of data. And so I was actually freed up to wear a regular watch in between. So given that, why would I even purchase the new Epix? Well, really, I was just interested in seeing that beautiful display on a big screen. I figured I'd get it and then just send it back. So, here we are. Let's start with the obvious. Out of the box, it looks like a Phoenix 7X. It is big, it is black, it is an action movie watch. If you like your sports watch to track your half marathon training and then rescue hostages, it's perfect. And then you fire up this screen and there's just no question, it looks very, very good. That beautiful AMOLED display sat inside that hulking great frame. If you take something pretty and increase its size enough, it turns out sometimes everything just clicks. And then beyond that, everything gets a little bit, hmm. I suppose the first thing is, what about the new Phoenix 7 Pro? As I said before, I thought the Phoenix would get this display 
And once that happened, I'd be surprised if anybody bought the Epics. As it's turned out, they've given the Epics the size alternatives to the Phoenix, and that left me slightly puzzled as to who would buy a Phoenix. Because really, there's only two significant advantages to the Phoenix, and neither are really significant for most people. It has better battery life as a result of a less power-hungry memory in pixel MIP display. And on the solar models, the assistance of some sunlight charging that doesn't increase battery, but does slow battery usage. But the difference is not massive. In fact, on the 51mm versions, battery life between Epics and Phoenix is pretty comparable. Smartwatch functionality, around 30 days, all the sat-nav functionality working and playing music, down to about 16 hours. Having the Epics display running permanently on will eat into that. Having solar power on the Phoenix will give you a bit of a boost. But for my purposes, it just means what it always did. Sticking it on charge once a week and being very comfortable, it will easily last for any all-day endurance activity that I do. When you come down to the 47 and 42 mil versions, the smaller battery does mean less power, but again, there's not a vast difference between Epics and Phoenix. I don't think many will notice much difference in how often you charge one versus the other. Also worth noting the charging speed has been increased as well. DC Rainmaker, who has some awesome videos deep diving into these things right now, has stated almost 20% charge from being plugged in for just 10 minutes. I just did a test here, plugging it into the USB port on my Mac, and it went from 50 to 60% charge in seven minutes. So it's never gonna be the case that you can't go and record an activity because it's low on juice. Plug it in while you get your trainers on and it will be good to cover 90% of most stuff. I'm sure there will be some people watching who say no. For me, I need to be able to set the watch to last as long as possible because I go hiking for days and days and, I don't know, live with the bears. Cool, the Phoenix will then last longer. But your needs are not the norm. And beyond battery, it just comes down to the display. And in summary, and I can hear Beardy Flapjack Man kicking the raccoon off his keyboard so he can dive into the comments and express his outrage at this, but the Phoenix display is dull and washed out. The Epix display is shiny and sexy. Even the upgraded MIP display on the new Phoenix Pro can't really compete with this. Shiny and sexy uses more battery, but as I just explained, it's not a huge difference and you can easily set the display to dim after a certain point or turn off altogether if you really wanna eke out as much juice from it as possible. I haven't done that. Mine is switched to always on, so it's always dim but viewable and then bright as can be with a flick of the wrist until my sleep schedule comes in at 11 p.m. when the display goes off and only an actual button press brings it on at the lowest brightness setting. Perfect. The other criticism leveled at the AMOLED display is you can't see it clearly outdoors in bright sunlight. Basically, the MIP display is illuminated by the sun, so it becomes very clear in bright light, but the AMOLED display needs to effectively compete against the sunshine lighting itself. So for the outdoor activities, the theory is Phoenix wins. But not in my experience. Side by side, they are both perfectly visible outdoors. I've run and cycled in the Epic since I've had it. Not once have I thought the display was anything other than crystal clear and sharp. In fact, I did a 10K race yesterday, really bright sunny day here in the UK. Screen was perfect. And the minute you're not in bright sunlight, there's just no comparison. The Epix makes the Phoenix screen look very old. Maybe there is a particular set of circumstances that could combine where the Phoenix screen is noticeably clearer, but I haven't encountered them. In fact, I found the display to be just superb, especially the maps where the extra detail on the Epics stands out a lot, which is especially useful if you're using the new screen option to display extra data on top of a map. As somebody who has been incredibly happy with the old style display for a very long time, I've had to think quite hard before concluding this but pretty is better, and pretty packaged like this is near on perfect. So having covered the battery and the display, and given that the functionality of the Epix and the Phoenix is now almost identical, I have no idea why anybody would buy a new Phoenix. This thing just looks great. It almost encourages you to interact with it because of how inviting that screen is. There's a degree of honeymoon period going on here, I know that. I'm currently hopping between different watch faces and getting very excited at the amount of data crammed on the screen the dark inky blacks and the vivid reds and greens, that enthusiasm won't last. But my belief is that this beats the Phoenix Pro and I can't say I'm gonna change my mind on that. So which Epix Pro model is the best? That's simply gonna come down to your personal taste. They all get the cool features, even the surprisingly useful LED flashlight that last year was only available on the big Phoenix 7X. So whatever size and color suits you, 
I appreciate not everybody has a 14-year-old moron inside them crying out for big as possible. For example, Jenna is likely to upgrade her Phoenix 7S to the equivalent smallest version Epix Pro, and while that means a bit less battery, if she can last all day as it is, strapping on something huge that looks disproportionate, intimidating even, that's pointless and not as much fun as it sounds. So before we talk about how the Apple Watch fits into all this, is buying the latest Garmin flagship the most sensible Garmin to get? Because right now, some of the previous versions are looking very good value for money. And on that one, I'm kind of sticking with what I said in my previous videos. In many ways, things peaked with the Garmin Phoenix 6 for me. Everything since then has either been a small increase to something that already worked pretty well, or the introduction of something perhaps nice, but far from essential. For example, the touchscreen is lovely and works brilliantly, but I never use it except occasionally to move around on the map screen. The five button layout on a Garmin is just so easy to use, especially when you're not looking at the watch on the start line of a race or something. And while the touchscreen is clever, it doesn't like getting soaking wet. I was sweating all over it in the sauna yesterday and it just didn't want to play. There are then upgrades to the hardware that routinely pop up on each new variant, and it's happened on the pro versions here, but whether that is a deal breaker for you or not really comes down to how accurate you want things to be. Is this heart rate monitor now on the pro models a step up from what we had before? Yes, apparently, but I never had much of an issue with the previous version. Some said it never worked great if the watch was not sat flat on your wrist. So maybe fine running, but you start bending your wrist in weird ways, it would struggle to get a reading. So for example, lifting weights. But aside from the obvious solution to wear a chest strap and get superb accuracy, which I still do with the pro sometimes, are people lifting weights and worrying about spot-on pulse readings? I guess maybe at this point some CrossFit types will be yelling, what about us? But really, if you're doing CrossFit and the device can detect any sort of pulse at the end of a session, you've done all right anyway. This fifth gen heart rate monitor is supposed to be more accurate even under like-for-like -like optimal conditions, but I've done a couple of activities wearing the Epix Pro and the old Phoenix, and the data looks pretty much the same to me. I suppose it's possible my pulse might hit a 190 a minute high momentarily that the Pro picks up, but the old Phoenix thinks it never went above, I don't know, 187. But I've got to be honest, at almost 50, if my pulse is anywhere near that high, I have other things on my mind than checking it that closely. I'm probably seconds away from the finish line of a race or trying to stay conscious powering the bike up a hill or date night is in full swing. All I really need is am I in zone one or two or three when I'm supposed to be? Is my resting heart rate nice and low? What was my average pulse during an activity? Does it give me accurate enough heart rate variability readings to show trends in my fitness over time? If I'm doing intervals, can I see when I've recovered sufficiently? Bottom line, for me, the heart rate monitoring has always been good enough for a long time. And the same applies to stuff like the GPS tracking. Again, it's now supposed to be as good as it gets but I never found myself looking back over a 50K trail race and being disappointed because at one point it thought I went round the tree on the left and I know I went round it on the right. I've always been really impressed with it. If I do a five or 10K race, it tells me I did a five or 10K race. If I do laps on the track, it has always picked them up accurately. The only standout improvement I've noticed in tracking is going from the Phoenix 6 to the Phoenix 7. The 7 would get a GPS signal much quicker accuracy has always been fine for me. And lastly, there are the software updates, but many of them are filtering down to the previous models anyway, so they don't necessarily all stand out as selling points for the new versions. And much like the touchscreen, I've often found the features to be cool and exciting for about a day, and I never look at them again. Or in the case of things like the stamina function that got added a while ago, when I did look at it, for example, with six hours to go in an ultramarathon, it told me I had zero energy left. Oh. And was thus rather pointless. There's no question that the data now available is extensive. Training readiness, endurance score, acute load, there's even a hill climbing metric. So if you're somebody keen to unplug your brain and work out based on what your watch tells you, you're probably in very good hands. For me, I'm a little old fashioned. I don't mind waking up in the morning and just thinking, how do I feel? And then exercising accordingly. So if you already own a Phoenix 6 and are happy with it, stick with it. If you own a 7, upgrading to the 7 Pro might well leave you with some real buyer's remorse. In fact, while I can see upgrading from a 7 to the Epix Pro, as I did, could be of some value if you're really into your pretty screens, I'd be amazed if someone upgrading from a 7 to a 7 Pro felt they got real value for money. I'd say what I've been saying to people for a while now, 
If you watched one of my older videos on the Garmin and you went and got yourself one, you probably did the right thing. I would still very happily recommend the Phoenix as a brilliant sports watch for anybody interested in their exercise. If you want great value for money and are looking to buy your first sports watch or upgrade from a much older version, picking up a U6 or now a U7 is gonna be a bargain. So if the Phoenix 7X is now gonna be up for sale and the Epix Pro is now my go-to Garmin, complete with brightly colored display, almost as good as the Apple's, will I still be wearing this? And the answer is yes, but I will be doing so with increasing frustration. It has always looked very far from rugged and I've never really enjoyed wearing it as a result. I've almost been annoyed that it's my only option to get phone functionality without my phone. Admittedly, interacting with the display is always pleasing, but Garmin now has that too, and it's the better sports watch. And so really I simply wear the Apple when I need my phone, but don't wanna carry my phone. And that's pretty much it. That said, that is a lot of the time. I'll often go to the gym, for example, which is only a short walk away, and I'll not wanna take anything with me. So I just stick my AirPods in, grab my water bottle and go. Same if I'm out running or even walking the dog. But if I'm doing a race or a long endurance event where my phone will be with me anyway, or some sort of event with photographers where I wanna look rugged, it's Garmin time. So let's summarize. If you already own a Garmin Phoenix 6 from a few years ago, then you likely have more sports tracking tech than you will ever need. So do not hesitate to stick with it if you're happy with it. Phoenix 6, man, I love this watch. And if you're simply buying a sports watch for the first time, well, if you've got a thousand pound to spend and you want the best that there is, it probably now is this, the Epix Gen 2 Pro. But you could save yourself 700 quid, get an old Phoenix 6 and have something still very, very good. Because don't forget, especially if you've been pouring through the details on the updates to things like the GPS on this and the heart rate monitoring, the vast majority of people that own these watches do what I do. Occasional five or 10K, maybe the old bike ride. They may even go so far as an ultra marathon or an Ironman. And their technology to help you train for and then monitor those events has always been superb for a long time. There are things anybody can do to improve their sporting performance, but dropping hundreds of pounds to upgrade a brilliant bit of kit to a slightly more brilliant bit of kit is not top of the sensible list. Which all leaves me pretty much where I was last time. Desperate for Apple to overcome their insistence that this bland little rectangle is what a sports watch should look like and make it look like this, or for Garmin to get this working as a mobile phone. Yes, it will link with your phone and display texts and calls, but you can't do much with it beyond that, and you need your phone with you in the first place. So, as before, you will often see me wearing the Garmin in videos, because those videos often feature races and events where it is the tool for the job. You might not see the Apple so much because I'm normally wearing it when I want to be out and about carrying as little as possible, so probably not filming anything. And sometimes I'll be wearing neither, which quite possibly makes me a very inappropriate person to take advice from on devices designed for 24 seven monitoring. As always, I'm not an expert. I'm not really suggesting what you should even do. Just giving my opinion, and explaining what I'm doing. Okay, that is it. Like, subscribe, please. Check out the Patreon for exclusive content, including the podcast. And if you're in the market to adopt a psychotic dog with a taste for cardboard, you can have him for free. I'll even chuck in a Phoenix 7.